Hi, it's Jeff. And Denise from MouseSteps.com. And this is episode number 116. <laughs> 116. Of Mouse Steps Weekly. <laughs> Sponsored by Theme Park Connection in Orlando, Florida. A wonderful place to get all your Christmas, early Christmas shopping done. I, I always start mine very early, right after the previous well, Christmas. you're ahead of the game. <laughs> and PixieVacations.com, a terrific place to get your uh, vacations for Halloween and Christmas this year. Disney World should be awesome. That's right. And also Maple Leaf Tickets, our official ticket agency, the best deals on tickets in town. On with the show. First, we're going to talk about Disney on Ice Presents Frozen. We were invited to a preview of it at the Amway Arena, and uh, we just want to give a brief overview. Oh, it's baby Anna and Elsa building Olaf for the first time as a snowman. I thought that was so cute. I mean, the whole show is fantastic. And, you know, it follows along very well to the film. So if you know the story, you really can understand everything that's going on here. And if you love Frozen, you will absolutely love this show. And if you love the music of Frozen, pretty much every song is performed. So you will hear your favorite song, that's for sure. And we have uh, Elsa here getting ready for Coronation Day. That's right. She's going to become Queen Elsa. Queen Elsa. Elsa. That's right. <laughs> well, you have some facts and figures uh, about the show. Oh, wait a minute. Here is Hans for, for the, the first, first time. time. First time we're ever going to see Hans. And right, he doesn't meet and greet in the parks or anything. This is really Very a exciting, first character yes. appearance. That's right. Oh, and your sandwiches song. I love that song so much. Yeah, Love is an Open Door is the actual name. And that's one of my favorite songs from the film. I know. And uh, there are 108 different costumes in this show, which is amazing. There's actually over 650 costume pieces that make up the costume. And there's some great effects. Take a look. It's snowing. Somehow, the village of Arendelle got turned into wintertime. I think Elsa had something to do with that. And it happened several times, actually, during the uh, during the show. And look at this. The first time ever we see Sven. Well, we saw the baby Sven right, earlier. Right, baby Sven. So there's several characters here that we've never seen before. You know, it was only recently that we started to see Kristoff at Disney's Hollywood Studios for Frozen Summer Fun. So, oh, here it is. It's the showstopper number. Let it go. Well, there's several showstopper numbers. This one was fantastic. And then, uh, obviously, Elsa is now in her... It's actually a silk chiffon dress by Parson Mears. Well, you sound like you're. we're narrating the Thanksgiving Day Parade here. A lot of great facts and figures (laughs) you have. But, you know, at this point, this is the end of the first act. We thought, how are they going to top this? There's the only way right there. I didn't think they'd top it, but I hope that they'd at least match it, and they did, which surprised me. And here we have uh, Olaf for the first time. Right, the first time Olaf has ever appeared live. I thought that was very, very exciting. I would love to see Olaf in the parks too. And of course, he is singing his uh, signature number in summer right there. And that's a terrific, a really terrific uh, number. That's right. So now Anna confronts Elsa and wants her to come home. She's up in her ice castle. And we're gonna, about to see a monster coming. Yes, Marshmallow, the snow monster. And he had some great effects here. Oh, look at the steam coming out of his mouth. It was, and it's, he's huge in real life. That that thing is giant. Another character we've never seen, and certainly oh, yes. not this one. Yeah. That's true. Many, many characters made their world debut at this uh, preview we saw the other night. And it will be, uh, the show is going to be all over the United States. I mean, not every city, but... Uh... Yeah, I've seen many, many of the Feld Ice shows, Disney on Ice over the years, and I'd have to say this is probably my favorite and that's true and here are the trolls there's 32 different trolls and they all are different this is my favorite part this move you see at almost every ice show but not with the bottom part of uh, olaf sneaking in <laughs> i love that that effect. was a fun that was a fun that was uh, one of the highlights for me there are 39 performers from 11 countries represented here wow that's a that's a big cast and this is Hans about to give away his true colors. Now, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but he might not be a great guy. And there are a lot of people that we've met who have never seen Frozen, which is actually really That's surprising amazing, to me. That's amazing, amazing. They do exist. They do exist. So I don't want to give everything away, but in true Disney fashion, everything turns out all right in the end. Here's Anna and Elsa, and all the Disney characters are going to come out in uh, one big celebration. Well, it's like a big magical moment, and I think it really ends the show perfectly. Disney on Ice presents Frozen. We loved it. Two thumbs up. We actually went back and saw the show again. And uh, one thing we forgot to mention before is they had some really cool merchandise for sale. Well, especially these snow cones out of Olaf's head. Well, you need an (laughs) Olaf head cup, of course. (laughs) And then Elsa there. See, they didn't have all the food items at the media preview, so it was definitely worth it to go back and check out this stuff, especially the cotton candy with the Olaf hat. And Jeff had been really wanting one, so I I, I went and I bought one uh, without him knowing. I kind of hinted that I really wanted (laughs) one. I don't know 
know why this picture is so, here with me in it, cute, though. Very cute in it. I love the hat. I, I thought it was awesome, and I thank you so much for getting it and surprising me. Great time. Highly recommend Disney on Ice Presents Frozen. Now we're going to move on to the Four Seasons. We went to the very best character breakfast I have ever been to in 40 years of going to these things around, as a kid growing up at Walt Disney World. What do I, you think? No, I totally agree. This is Good Morning Breakfast with Goofy and his pals. Uh, it's at the Ravello restaurant a couple times a week over at the Four Seasons. And it was, uh, I, we've been to the Empress Lily a long time ago. Yeah. And I oh, would yeah. say oh, this is come. still in there. There I am taking pictures. All new outfits. I love these outfits. So we'll, we'll get into that later. But it was just, the word I can use is, it was delightful. Absolutely delightful experience. And I just want to say, we paid for our own breakfast. So this isn't, this wasn't a media breakfast or anything. We just wanted to go over. We knew it would well, be we'll, very we'll popular. We'll get the bad part over with right at the beginning. The total cost, including tip for the two of us, was $97. Right. Because there was no discount or anything like that. So it wasn't cheap. But again, it was a memorable experience that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't couldn't do it every day, of course. But for a special occasion, I, I would definitely do this again. Well, it's $38 for adults and $18 for kids. That also includes PhotoPass photos. Uh, Disney, you see cast members running around, including the PhotoPass photographers. Right, we just saw him go by, right? And, and check out Minnie's. Uh, bow is actually a pair of glasses. Sunglasses. That was great. I loved it. And the characters, I mean, they were they were spectacular. They they gave such good interactions with everybody. And when getting back to the photo pass, they give you a special Four oh, look, Seasons photo pass. I know Goofy's shoes. Those are tremendous. They're Goofy size shoes. <laughs> and the photo pass is, includes all the pictures they take. So that's actually a added value. It's included, you know, the pictures. Right. Uh, free downloads. And when we got it, uh, we didn't know how often we We'd see the characters, but because it wasn't busy, we ended up seeing them a lot. So we ended up with like 20 photos. This was pretty fun. I was telling Goofy, I was actually asking him about Max, his son, and he was telling me that uh, Max is in school and he was praying that he gets good grades. So How it did was... you even know what he said? <laughs> so I remember talking to Goofy. You don't forget an important conversation like and, that. And every so often, if you've ever been to a place like Chef Mickey's where they do the, the flag, the but, well, napkin look, look waving and look such. <laughs> you, for all the viewers out there, Denise was just waving her hand in the air like she had an imaginary napkin as Mickey. Mickey was doing it as he was walking by. That was brilliant, too, but oh, nobody will ever see that. <laughs> well, every every so often they have what I think they call it a magical moment or something like that uh, every half hour or so. And in this case, it was napkins being waved, but I don't believe it was always napkins. No, it it's, was a, other... it's a different show every time or a different little bit. At least do. when we were there. We were there over an hour. Probably. Yeah, we were there about an hour and a half, but Maybe we were in no hurry. Half. Right. There was characters and food. I know, but we didn't, we didn't spend as much time on the food because the characters were so so playful and so great. That's actually true. I've probably put less effort into the food than I've <laughs> ever done at a character meal. Look at how this little girl is so enthralled by uh, Minnie Mouse there. It's just wonderful interactions. And I was going to say on Twitter, I had like my biggest Twitter day ever because... Everybody was really in love with these new costumes. Oh, this was outside. It was beautiful, a beautiful morning. So it was nice to be actually outside and get a picture with all three of the characters. We can't guarantee that'll happen every time, but in our case, it did. Let's take a look at the food here. And these are, uh, well, they have, you know, the everyday items like scrambled, scrambled eggs. eggs. Now, these, I don't know if they'll have them all the time. Chicken There's sausage. Several items that they will switch out every day. Right, right. I think that's the breakfast the potatoes. Hash, right, like a hash brown. But this chicken corn dog absolutely fantastic you wouldn't think a chicken corn dog would be good for breakfast it worked believe me it worked for that me that will not be there every day right that and won't then they have the applewood smoked bacon and you had an omelet which we never took a, <laughs> even a photo of <laughs> see that's that tells you how great the characters were because i mean i had this beautiful omelet we made a special thing and i just ended up eating it no picture. I mean, to, all the, to, to anyone watching, it's probably normal to just eat the food when you get it. But we're so conditioned to take pictures. It was kind of crazy. We didn't. And I will say that there's like food in all kinds of nooks and crannies. And until the end, I think there's still a couple things I didn't see. But like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, look, this beautiful homemade bread. And I didn't see that until we're really on our way oh, out. Oh, and the smoked salmon that we kind of whizzed by there was yes. delightful also. And then they have limoncello. limoncello without alcohol so that the kids can have it too. That's right. We've had their alcoholic limoncello and it is a doozy, I'll tell you. <laughs> and then this is the kids area. So you have the sausages and the, uh, and I believe eggs and, and such again. I like the little pig there. Yeah. Very cute. 
And then also they had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's every day. I think we'll be seeing them. See, they're already made and cut in half there, the peanut butter and jelly. It was also very cute. So, and there's, I mean, everybody really seemed to have such a great time. And this is not a huge restaurant. So I don't know if it will ever seem very crowded. Well, one thing, another thing we should mention is Going in, I thought it would be very loud in there, like some of these character breakfasts are. But they seem to put couples or people without kids in a in a room off to the side, away from the family. So it seemed. I mean, At for us, for if we us. if we wanted a quiet meal, we could have had it. And also, um, they gave out character autograph cards with. Mickey, Minnie, and Goofy on it. Oh, yeah, pre-signed. They're very nice, collectible, perfect size to fit in your scrapbook. Right. And uh, I'm just looking. I, I just really enjoyed the photo pass, though, because we had our own photos taken with our own cameras, and then the photo pass added such value. So, again, I would say two thumbs up for us. I would definitely go back. I'm sure you would go back. Yes. And this is a breakfast that you can book, I believe, through Disney or through the Four Seasons. A uh, manager said that she believed also open table, but there's at least two ways to book this breakfast. And I should mention this is in the Golden Oak community, so you'll have to go through security there. But it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, drive on the way in. Some really nice houses you'll see. I totally agree. We love this breakfast and highly recommend it. And now we are heading to Bush Gardens for Falcon's Fury. That's right. They just opened it, and it is 335 feet super drop tower. <laughs> and uh, we sent Dave Drummondhiller because we <laughs> couldn't make it. And uh, he did a great job. He even interviewed designer Jeff Hornick on the drop tower. I would have loved to see you do this interview. I no, Just I watching have done Dave it. go up that thing. He's so calm. I, I give him full credit. What a great job he did. He did. I don't think I would have been able to talk at all going up. So he was the right person for the job. So here he is with Jeff Hornick uh, on Falcon's Fury. So I'm here with Jeff Hornick, the director of uh, design and engineering for Bush Gardens. Yes. We're going to go up into Falcon's Fury. So, uh, Jeff, how long has this ride been in development? You know, we've been working on this ride for about three years now, and we've been uh, working on construction since June of last year. Oh, uh, okay, okay. And it is, uh, from my understanding, the, the tallest freestanding drop tower in the continent. Yep, yep, oh. tallest freestanding drop tower, 335 feet tall. Wow. So, putting that to perspective, you know, you've got Shikra, Shikra's 200 feet tall. And if you add Cheetah Hunt on top of that, it's 102 feet. And you add another 33 feet to get to the height of this ride. Wow. So okay. as you're riding up, you can see Shikra on your right over here, right? So you can really tell, all right, so once we get to Shikra height, that, now we're 200 feet tall. Now we've got to get, you know, now a quarter of the way to get up to the top. Wow. That is amazing. So how many times have you ridden so far? Jeff? So I've ridden about a dozen times. This is probably about our 13th time, lucky 13. What's your favorite part of the ride? Oh, my favorite part is the amazing views. You can see all of downtown Tampa, and you see some amazing views as you're looking straight down at the ground. Right now, the view is of the earth. <laughs> wow. This is something. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely amazing, Jeff. Oh, it's a great ride. Never been on anything like that, ever. Huge rush, right? I think you're uh, changing the scope of drop towers for, for the future. Oh, that's oh, great. <laughs> Wow. Wow is right. Just I, watching that. <laughs> I was on the edge of my seat just watching a second time. So we'll and, have to get you on this thing as soon as possible. We, we can hold hands, do it together. That would be a video. And and he uh, actually wrote it again another time before he left. So really, really enjoyed it. As you said earlier, we definitely picked the right guy for the job. Thanks to Dave Drumheller. And now we're heading into Bobby Burgess. Bobby Burgess, we spoke to him about his new book. It's Ears and Bubbles. Dancing my way from the Mickey Mouse Club to the Lawrence Welk Show. We did cut down the interview. It was about a half hour, and I believe we have about 12 minutes to share with you. And uh, we're both huge fans of the, the original Mickey Mouse Club. All right, so here it is, our interview with Bobby Burgess. What inspired you to write Ears and Bubbles? Ears and Bubbles, Dancing My Way from the Mickey Mouse Club to the Lawrence Welk Show. Well, I'll tell you, I had fans, when I would tell stories to them, they would say, why don't you write a book and put these down on and ink and paper. And I thought, well, you know, someday I will. It took me two years. I wrote it longhand on yellow paper. And then uh, finally my wife typed it up and uh, we got uh, 
theme park press to publish it for me. And Lorraine said, totally, who worked for Disney for years as a publicist at Disneyland and the studio to edit it for me. So it's uh, my recollections of all my great times that I had with the Mickey Mouse Club and the Lawrence Welk Show. I mean, I went from one family institution to another. I was really lucky in my career. And it's kind of amazing that... When you were when you were a teenager, did you think that you know at this point in your life you would still be talking about the Mickey Mouse Club? No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when we had our 25th anniversary at Disneyland, we did five shows a day, 16 numbers, and at that time we thought, guys, it's been 25 years since the Mickey Mouse Club debuted in '55. They won't ask us back to do anything else. Well, every big holiday at Disneyland. We were in parades and we were singing and dancing at Videopolis at the space stage. And uh, so finally, even in the 50th, they called us and we performed again. And I did a bug with Sharon and Cubby played his drums and Tommy sang and we sang Monday through Friday and we did all the moves and everybody was in good spirits and good health. Thank goodness for those of us who are still with us. What was your first meeting with Walt Disney like? Okay, the first time Walt Disney, I believe, ever was involved with us was at the audition. And I went through actually five auditions because I lived in Long Beach. I had to come clear up on the street. I mean, not on the street, but <laughs> oh, not, not on freeways. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was like an hour each way. And I went through five auditions. And finally, on the fifth audition, one of the uh, producers said, no, be on your best today because Walt Disney's going to be here. But he stood in the back. He didn't really make himself known at that time, and that's when he first saw us. I think the first time I ever really met him was I got chosen along with Sharon, Mouseketeer Sharon, mm -hmm. to escort President Sukarno's son, along with Walt Disney, around Disneyland in 1955. And it was interesting because we rode in the golf cart, and, and Sharon and I and the, the son in the back seat, and President Sukarno and, and Walt in the front, and you know, that's when I first got to see how proud he was of his new domain and driving mm -hmm. us around all over Disneyland and, and talking to us and all. So I think that's when I first really got to know him. Though so I don't think anybody really knew him as a Mouseketeer, I think, because he was more like a high school principal. He didn't <laughs> run up and say, hi, Uncle Walt. <laughs> He, uh, he wanted us to call him Uncle Walt, but we were the 50s kids, so we always called him Mr. Disney. But, uh, yeah, we did have interaction through the years. I mean, we did a, a, a preview to our Rainbow Road to Oz on the Disneyland show, and we worked with him, and he had his lines, and, you know, we've worked with him there. and We, we saw him here, there, and everywhere. And um, I actually saw, uh, I guess you had a special where you danced with Sharon, and that was before, in Disneyland, and that was before anybody knew who you were. That's right. That was 1955 when the park opened, and that was in July, July 17th. And of course, our show didn't come on until October. So uh, I like I like the quote that uh, Art Linkletter said at the time: "These are the dancing children who <laughs> featured as a thing called the Mouseketeers on the new Mickey Mouse Club debuting this fall." <laughs> and so here we were singing and dancing, and I was just going crazy with Sharon doing my jitterbug dance in front of that theater. It was a hot day that day. And we were in talent roundup outfits, which were made of wool. And uh. the, the, the concrete was kind of soft and uneven, and we had to dance on that. And then we put on our horses, these little stick horses, and we galloped around the main street, around the hub, in the, in the first parade. And, you know, it's so much fun because now that I'm a grandfather, I have four children of my own and now three grandchildren. I get to take it to Disneyland and show them all those great things that I experienced growing up as a teenager at Disneyland in the 50s. And I know Disneyland means a lot to you. Didn't you get engaged to your wife? I did. <laughs> I tried to figure out something really unique. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, Disneyland is very romantic at night. The lights are twinkling. And so I, I got on the, uh, I got, she and I went on the bucket ride, which is uh, the, the skyway from Tomorrowland to Fantasyland. And you know, the music was playing When You Wish Upon a Star, and as we went through the Matterhorn, I, I asked her to marry me, and we had a nice kiss, and so I think that's quite a memorable connection to Disneyland mm -hmm. after all these years. My wife and I have been married 43 years now. Congrat congratulations. Thank you, and that's very unusual for show business, you know. It really is, and it's, you know, lovely that you get to take your, you know, your grandkids, your kids and your grandkids to a place where you got engaged. Yes, for sure. For and, sure. and where you work, too. Yes, and after all these years, they still give us a pass to get in. So oh, do you really? I can get to every, go into every 
park in the world to take my family. Isn't that nice of them? That is actually very nice. Yeah, they renew it every year, so if you get in any kind of trouble, they won't renew it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean, I, I would love to go over to Tokyo and go into Disney Sea because we don't have that over here. There is um, a calliope here uh, at Walt Disney World. It's kept at Fort Wilderness, which was used in the Mickey Mouse Club Circus. Right. What was that? What was that like for you? That was so much fun. We had a great time. Our parents, not parents, but my mom and Sharon's mom were Chip and Dale. They got six dollars a day for two shows. <laughs> we got to ride elephants. We got to ride horses. We were in a trapeze act. We dressed up as Peter Pan and Tinker Bell, and they turned out the lights, and we glowed in the dark as we swung the girls through the through the space. And uh, yeah, it was it was a blast. But you know, we even made some three D, um, some three D uh, uh, films from for that that are here and there and everywhere. I, I, I sometimes come across them. They're probably collectors by now. But it's the Mouseketeers at the Mickey Mouse Club Circus. And uh, of course, Walt Disney was not a hundred percent behind it. He said, "Why would I want people to come to a circus when they can actually come to Disneyland?" And so it wasn't a big success, but it was. Um, put on by the Ted DeWayne Circus. So it was a professional circus uh, troupe that was putting it on under a big red and white uh, tent where the submarine ride is today at Disneyland. It was called Holiday Hill. But they had, oh, they had camels and they had the zebras and they had a lion and tiger act and elephants and oh my gosh, it was a, it was a big deal. Yeah, it was fun. We really had fun on that one, yep. It's hard to imagine in Disneyland now having a circus like that, and I always sort of thought that maybe Walt Disney, you know, was the one who was sort of behind it, but I guess not as much. Not as much. I think, you know, they had the great idea, and he probably okayed it, but not 100%. I don't know mm -hmm. exactly what went on, but, uh, you know, it was, it was really a good one. It was a good one. Um, like I say, um, I was a, what they call a web setter for my part mm -hmm. of the... Um, trapeze act. In other words, Mouseketeer Bonnie would climb to the top of the of the tent and I would swirl her around and around and then she'd be with like one hand and be twirling in place. And same with over with Sharon. Sharon would be the same with Tommy was the center. And then the other ones would be on swinging ladders. And then there was a girl in the center who would go over and over. Now she wasn't a Mouseketeer, she was a trained uh, circus performer, but she was get going higher and higher on a swing until she would go upside down and upside down and round and round. So it was really spectacular. I wonder if there's any film available of that circus. That would be really interesting. To it, it's so hard to even, you know, find too many pictures. It would be wonderful. Like these days, there's video of everything. So maybe one of these days something will pop up. Mm -hmm. I would love to see it, too. Sure. But I do remember the Calliope. Yeah, that was part of the Mickey Mouse Club Circus when it went around. And we had a big circus parade right at the beginning. And boop, 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 boop. There it goes, you know. Yeah. Did all of the male Mouseketeers have a crush on Annette? You know, I think they did. <laughs> if, not, if not outwardly, secretly. She was so nice and so beautiful. And, of course, we watched her go through adolescence right before our eyes. But uh, she kind of liked the older guy. She was in love with Zorro. She was <laughs> Guy Williams. So for her 16th day, Walt Disney gave her an appearance on the Zorro show. And he got to hug her and... We heard about that for the next month or so because <laughs> I went to school with only six others in the, uh, in the little red schoolhouse. It was, uh, you know, except for Tommy Kirk, everybody st spoke Spanish to each other because our teacher was so good with all kinds of languages mm -hmm. and we had to learn everything. Tommy Kirk wanted to learn German. Oh. Yeah. I guess Annette was actually uh, in love with Paul Anka at that time and liked, you know, she also liked Fabian and she also liked Frank. <laughs> You know, we Musketeers were, were pretty young. Girls were ahead of the boys at that time, <laughs> as far as maturing. You know, my voice didn't even change until I was 15 and a half, so that's where I was. <laughs> All my stories are in my book, Ears and Bubbles, and like I said, dancing through the years from the Mickey Mouse Club to the Lawrence Welk Show. It, it's, it's on Amazon right now, so anybody can get it on Amazon.com. And it's also at your bookstore. All you have to do is go in and ask for the Ears and Bubbles by Bobby Burgess, and they'll order it for you if it's not on the shelves. And we look forward to reading that. And is there anything else you wanted to say about Ears and Bubbles? No, except it's just so much, it was just so, was just so much fun writing it because it just recalled my life, and I've had a great life. Like I said, 
you know, Walt Disney and Lawrence Welk, but, you know, my family stayed together. My mom and dad were married almost 60 years, and um, I, I have a wonderful family of four kids that are just great in every way. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, my wife and I love to travel, so we, we've really been all over the world. I have a map with pins in it that every place that I've been with, with Christy, and uh, that's what we love to do. In fact, I've taken my two boys, and we're going to the Mardi Gras this year. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I'm sure I'm sure we're going to see lots of uh, lots of Musketeers in the future <laughs> because we're still close friends. My my son Robert is best friends with Musketeer Tommy's son uh, Casey's. What? So anyway, uh, yeah. Through the years, we'll all be friends wherever we may be. <laughs> That's how the song goes, and it's true. That was great, and I really enjoy hearing stories about Walt Disney and about Disneyland, and of course the Mickey Mouse Club from somebody who was actually there back then. You know, it was very interesting to me. Well, the original Mickey Mouse Club was my Mickey Mouse Club, so it's it's so exciting to you get to talk to You weren't alive in 1955. No, but that was my first Mickey Mouse Club. I didn't. I. That's not age us. <laughs> 60s is when I was born. Right. Well, I, I totally know what you mean. And, and the same with me, the reruns of the original Mickey Mouse Club. That's what I grew up on in the afternoons. And I just want to say we'll have more to the interview in the article, and that should be up in the next day or two. So anyway, thanks again to Bobby Burgess. We appreciated the time. And that's another show. That's another show. Thank you to PixieVacations.com. They are our official travel agency. And uh, definitely check them out online. Also, Maple Leaf Tickets, our official ticket agency, the best deals on tickets in town. We appreciate them very much and check them out. And Theme Park Connection, they have been with us from the very beginning and they are on the way from the airport to Walt Disney World. That's right. So very convenient. Yes. Anyway, thanks again for listening. We'll see you all next week and have a great week. Have a great week.